Welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us here at the Personalised Health Summit 2015. We're here today with Dario Nadi. I'm very, very excited for this call. But first I just want to touch base and highlight again the intention for this summit. And we're bringing together 30 experts from all over the world in the areas of health, uh, from exercise, nutrition, sleep, uh, through to health, happiness and the brain today. We're talking about the neuroscience of personality and how that influences our fun and our happiness and the things we do in our social context. So our intention is for you to be collating a lot of this information to be able to sort through all of this uh, information that exists out there in the world to find out how to make yourself or how to be heading towards a place of health and happiness for you. And a huge thank you to our major sponsors, the Ultimate Human Foundation, who are working tirelessly towards the elimination of all chronic pain and disease from the planet, and to PH360, who is uh, really putting together the tangible ways that we can harness our personalised health and our epigenetics uh, to bring together some tangible information to operate from a place of health. So we're welcome today, but the biggest thanks goes to you for giving up the time uh, and investing this time into yourself to be here to learn all these great new things that are out there for us to harness. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome Dario to today. Dr. Dario Nardi is a world-renowned author, speaker and expert in the fields of neuroscience and personality. He holds a current position as senior lecturer at University of California, Los Angeles, uh, where he won UCLA's Copenhagen Award for Innovative Use of Technology in 2005 and UCLA's Distinguished Teacher of the Year in 2011. His books include Neuroscience of Personality and The Eight Keys to Self-Leadership, amongst other titles. He's a creator of the Personality Types and Love Therapy app for the iPhone. Dr. Dario Nadi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Matt, for having me. It's a pleasure to, uh, to uh, share the results of my passion over the last nine years. Beautiful. And uh, I love how you start with that, Dario, because we're going to delve straight into that, uh, this, this concept of passion, fun, social context, how our brain even works with this is just such a fascinating area right now. Uh, I'd love just to, to hear a little bit about you to start with and how you got to this point in time and how you became fascinated with the brain and, and neuroscience and, and how we can start to harness some of these understandings to help us move towards a place of health. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my background is not in neuroscience directly because when I was in university, um, we didn't have that as a major. This is a really young degree. Uh, nonetheless, about 20 years ago, I got certified in psychological testing and uh, did various things in that field. And about nine years ago, I, um, well, there was a colleague who hinted that maybe I would be a good person to investigate the connections between neuroscience, uh, sort of the brain and, and personality. And I had some teaching award money. Um, and use that to get started. And it's been a fantastic adventure since then. <laughs> Beautiful. And Dario, how did you end up uh, in the current uh, state that you're in? I know you're, you're now a world leader in the, the field of neuroscience and really looking at how the application of understanding how the brain works with various different um, you know, studies that you do and the research you're involved in. How did you actually get to do the exact research you're doing today? And, and you know, how does this apply to us? How can we start to harness some of these understandings that you've learned uh, in the fields? Yeah, well, certainly there are, there are thousands of people working on various pieces about the brain. And as far as I can tell, I mean, several people have told me it seems like I'm the only person um, looking at sort of the brain and, and personality in a sort of a holistic systems way. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of it is just doing the hard work every single day for nine years. And I don't mean hard as it's not fun, because it's a lot of fun. Every person is unique. Uh, I've seen over 200 people come into the lab. Uh, I spend at least an hour with each of them. I mean, you were a subject as well. You may remember your session. And um, I know in case any of you are wondering about Matt, I have a little dossier right to the side here. Um, I usually spend two hours or more with the person, getting to know them, their background, understanding the results, helping them debrief and make meaning out of it. Uh, even organized a few things for people who've done it 30 or so in different uh, organizations to talk to each other and, and share their results as professionals. And um, it really is it's just one person after the next. And uh, thank goodness we all have uniqueness and variety, otherwise we'd get pretty boring, but people still surprise me. <laughs> That's great to hear. And, uh, and Daria, one of the things I will share about uh, um, you know, the sessions that we had together uh, it was very interesting, and this is, um, I know that even in the fields of neuroscience, um, this is you know, a bit to, a bit further down the track now, but you know, in the mainstream, we're just, just still hearing about and excited about how we can actually hook up someone's brain with these electrodes and measure the electrical activity and get a lot of learnings from that, which we call EEG. Uh, and you look even further than that again, where 
the EEG. And I remember when we hooked my brain up initially, we didn't find a lot of uh, action going on um, for whatever reason. And, and uh, of course, that was determined, I believe, because I was extremely efficient and didn't need a lot of activity to perform the tasks. In fact, I think <laughs> I was, uh, uh, you know, having a conversation about politics, reading some some uh, things, you know, looking at pictures, playing recall, uh, playing ball with some at the same time, and there wasn't a lot going on. But in the background, you've certainly looked a lot more into that as to how each region of the brain communicates with each other at a particular point in time. And it's even more so we're understanding now, it's not just which regions of the brain are firing to a certain extent, it's about how they're actually talking to each other in which patterns and at which timing, uh, which I think is uh, is just really great that you're doing, uh, you're, you're involved specifically in so many advancements in this area. So I'd love just to, to have you share a bit of insight about what you've learned in that uh, capacity. And then we're gonna start to link this towards um, us having some fun and some, you know, having a personality and how that even looks and what that even means from, from your perspective. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I'm glad you mentioned this because this has been um, a huge advance even in the area of, of EEG. So EEG or electroencephalogram is a technology that's been around over half a century in use in various ways, mostly in hospitals. And uh, beginning in the 90s, people began to think, oh well, this other technology, which is much more expensive, uh, fMRI is, is sort of going to be the holy grail. But of course, those holy grails usually don't work out as well. And there's just been a renaissance in understanding what we can do with this EEG technology. So it reveals two things. Um, one is information in the moment, different brain regions lighting up as people do tasks. And sort of as you mentioned, uh, you know, when, when folks do a protocol with me, it's about an hour or so, they do 20, 22 different tasks and a wide variety of things, using their cell phone, listening to music, doing math problems, uh, drawing, um, going on a little virtual speed date, uh, those kinds of things. It's very situational. The second kind of analysis is something that the computer does after the fact. And it's the, the whole thing is to locate which regions of the brain work together which, which regions are in sync, form a network. Uh, and it comes out of this key principle that neurons that fire together are wired together. And what does it take to get wired together? Well, it takes habit building. In other words, the things that you do every single day, all day long, it turns out repeating in your brain every few seconds, where you direct your attention. What kind of thoughts and emotions do you repeat in your brain? Um, uh, what kind of actions do you tend to take? So all of those things, those are habits. Burn those neural pathways in there. And essentially what we get with the person's brain wiring diagram is a picture of their developed self, their habitual ways of doing things in the world. Beautiful. And is that, uh, or how does that actually relate to our personality, Dario? So you have this amazing amount of information about someone and um, I guess moving from the neuroscience where we can look at you know, all this different activity, how do, how do you join the dots between what that does, you know, what that gives you as information and someone's personality? What sort of correlations have you found or, or how can you start to have a conversation about that these days? Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm really happy that at the very beginning I started uh, looking at personality. Uh, not just static behavioral traits on the outside, but cognitive processes, values, uh, people's needs, their backgrounds, their careers, uh, also, you know, just the whole gamut of things. Now, when I started with college students, it was more like just their major, but now looking at all people of all ages from 15 to 80 years old, um, you know, we, we do see great variety and there are patterns. Um, I'd like to say that we pretty much all have the same toolbox, but what varies are the tools that we prefer. And um, we tend to use and develop the tools that help us meet our practical needs, like in our career or you know, just surviving in school and so on. Uh, and we develop tools that meet our psychological needs, uh, our values, our deep-seated needs, um, sort of the, the things that are probably more physiological in nature, like needing to move around a lot versus being, uh, say, risk adverse or whatever it is. Um, and the totality of this is, is our personality. So sometimes neuroscience folks like to think that the brain is everything. I, I don't believe that. Um, that, that we really are, uh, the brain reflects a lot of who we are. And also we have all these connections uh, to, the, to the larger world, to our interactions with other people, 
our career, uh, probably the sort of personality propensities we were born with, which seem to account for at least 50% of the results, um, that, that all of that comes into play. Beautiful, Dario. And just taking that another step further, and we're talking a lot about personalized health this uh, summit, of course, and how that's different for everybody. Uh, we know now from a lot of the, the medical side of things that uh, in terms of our genetics, our genes only determine about 5 to 10% of our actual state of health at any particular point in time. And our environment and our lifestyle have a huge impact on how we can actually change uh, or, or adapt our gene expression at any point in time. So we have our genes and, of course, we can switch gene, certain genes on or certain genes off at many different times throughout the day or throughout, you know, even a, you know, can change within 20 minutes or less. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing a lot of science and research on that. How does that correlate with the brain? What are you finding in that area? How, like, how does our environment and our lifestyle and our context influence our brain activity and our personality? I, you know, I love that you asked that because there, there's probably a little bit of science fiction out there that um, suggests we can just magically take out a person's brain and put it in a little glass container and we'll still have the person there. And um, that just really is not the case. Uh, not only is the brain connected to the whole body, to the gut, the nervous system, and so on. Um, but at every moment, the brain is in motion because of the inputs we receive from the outside, because, you know, other people's reactions to us and so on, the environment, uh, because of the actions we're taking, how we're trying to coordinate or communicate with other people. Uh, so the brain is not the static thing. It's sort of like if you put somebody in a sensory deprivation tank, uh, you know, they actually begin to hallucinate and go a little bit crazy because the brain is meant to be in the environment, in the world. Um, certainly in terms of lifestyle, uh, there's, well, there's a couple of influences. One is just the quality of nutrients that we get uh, for a healthy brain function. This is not an area I study personally, but of course, you know, working in neuroscience, I'm aware of this. A huge thing is exercise. Uh, I don't mean, you know, stress, so stressful or whatever, it's going to hurt you. I'm talking about moderate exercise. Multiple studies with teenagers, with people in their 20s, with the elderly, keep showing that exercise is a huge contributor. Um, and I see certainly in my lab, part of the protocol is for people to stand up and toss a ball around and, and do some minor physical activity. And it's beautiful to see the brain just reset in those moments, to actually go to a very relaxed state for many people. Um, and, and just getting up and doing, you know, about your day, as you're going about your day, can, can really offer those opportunities for your brain to get released from the ruts it ends up in. Uh, the thought is also exercise aids with blood flow. It was not just about, you know, getting out of a rut, it's blood flow. Um, and dampening stress uh, is sort of a benefit that comes out of both of those. It's also enriching activities. Um, so we know with infants and toddlers, this is well established that a richer environment with toys and affection and so on, things that demand language use, tool use, social interaction, these help the brain grow and, and set down circuits um, that will really be there for the rest of their lives. In fact, it's sort of neat when I do look at people's brain wiring as adults, including even looking at my own, I got some results or I get some results with people that sometimes are a little bit surprising. I don't see it when I ask what is your career or from their personality profile. But when I dig into their childhood, for example, I learned to ski and surf and do a variety of whole body athletic activities when I was a child, from like eight to 15. And all of those are still with me in my brain, even now, because of those windows. Uh, so it's worthwhile uh, when considering, you know, what, what are some great ways to use your brain? What tools do you have to actually go back to your childhood and your teen years and, and reflect on that? Right. Um, yeah, and, and so those are, and, and certainly I would say that, that uh, you know, in seeing evidence of career, that those are the skills that get, or the activities that we do. This could be hobbies, too. It doesn't just have to be career. That, that those get burned into our brains. You might want to make sure that what you're repeating each day are really things that you want burned in there. Um, <laughs> you know, just because we repeat behaviors every few seconds, and those habits... Uh, get burned in time and again. So just, you know, keep in mind, if, if you want to use your brain differently, you do need different activities in different environments. Right, that's beautiful, Dario. Thanks. And I, I understand that that's um, something that you see from a very positive aspect as well. Is there anything that, uh, that you've seen, uh, like in your studies or in your times, that 
actually uh, can be reflective on the EEG studies you look at or the, the patterns that you read where people may have a, a recurring pattern that's been there from a childhood issue or from a from something that's uh, that's kept them in uh, sort of a, a negative pattern, if you like, uh, that, that does show up in in, uh, in some of your studies? Yeah, absolutely. So I have two stories here. Um, you know, one, one of them is more on the negative side and one of them is on the positive one. Um, yeah. and, and I think both of them would tell the story of, of who we are. So I had somebody uh, that I actually brought in uh, because I was curious about what was going on with him. So he did some personality profile stuff using Myers-Briggs, uh, with which I am really quite familiar. Uh, and, and I was surprised by his result. He did this at work, but it was all debriefed, and he himself agreed with the results after reflection. And I thought, wow, you know, he seems more introverted. He sort of, he scored and identified as an extrovert, but he seemed more introverted. And, and really, in particular, very worried uh, to me. Like, he did a lot of worrying, and that wasn't something that would normally go with the results he had gotten. Um, and, and then when I looked at the EEG, Overall, it very much actually agreed with his self-assessment and with the Myers-Briggs results. But there was one thing that really stood out. And he asked me, like, what is that one thing? And I said, well, there are these two regions that are working in tandem with each other all the time. Just these two, but, you know, it really is, it's a big piece. And he said, well, what do they do? And I said, well, a lot of it's going to show up like this is that you enter a social situation or maybe you think about one you're going to have and you're gonna to start to wonder and question it, and there's gonna be some worry, some feelings of worry that come in there. And then you may then decide, oh no, I don't wanna do that social interaction, or I wanna do it differently. But it's a combination of, of two parts of the brain, one that mediates social interaction, and the other one that involves a personal timeline, looking into the future uh, and, and considering what brings worry or relief when you think about the future. And I said, but, you know, I, I don't understand where this is coming from. And he said, no, but I do. It makes sense perfectly. And he explained that he grew up in a household with uh, an abusive alcoholic parent. And all the time, he and his siblings, every day for 18 years, had to think before they spoke or acted. That, that if they said or did the wrong thing, that that would evoke a negative reaction. To say the least. And so he developed this brain wiring around it that was counter to everything else that this personality. I brought out this picture of somebody who's a warrior. Um, and I think just this information, him being able to connect this and understand, wow, you know, how I feel now is based upon them, uh, was a little bit empowering right there, even before talking about what he said about it. Uh, the second story is... Um, Dario, just before you go into the second story, I'm just going to interrupt you there for a second because I'm losing your audio a little bit. But uh, I mean, that's just such an amazing uh, story in itself uh, where you know, we can really start to harness these understandings that our childhood and, and our circumstances and the emotions that we feel, the mm -hmm. events that we encounter, the circumstances we're in, mm -hmm. certainly influences and affects us in a very serious way. And this is something that, uh, that's very real um, and something that we need to be very mindful of as well with you know, parents and children and circumstances at schools and you know, colleges and all the, the things that we are you know, still just finding out now, we're really starting to understand from a scientific point of view now that you know, a lot of these things can, can last a very long time in the brain and can cause a huge uh, impact on what's happening in the future. So thanks for sharing that. And I'm looking forward to your positive story. I just sort of jump in there and give your, uh, your connection a chance to catch up. So please continue, thank you. Oh yeah, yeah, I think there, there was some vehicle outside on the road that was making like squealing its tires or something, causing this very low level sound. Can you hear me now? Perfect. I didn't know if it was the connection that was getting muddled up or certain parts of your brain that may have been firing differently, but uh, we're good to go now. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Fantastic. So um, the, the second story is about um, a gentleman in his mid-40s, and uh, two sort of things popped up. One is that uh, whenever he said the word boss, there was this very clear whole brain pattern that the EEG would turn the solid green. It was all what we call theta waves, uh, which would indicate... Uh, a sort of uh, an objective problem solving state, but also like body disassociated state. So in, it, it could be useful, but it could also indicate something negative. I think we've all had that experience with the boss, right? Maybe, maybe that elicited something negative. Well, whenever he mentioned his wife, he also got the same reaction. We saw this in the brain. 
And so I, mean, I knew I knew his wife, even though she wasn't there. And she's they're one of those couples where she sort of wears the pants in the family. And um, so I thought, well, OK, so, you know, his wife and his boss, uh, they sort of fall into the same same thing. Uh, but I, I was wrong, actually, on this. Uh, the story was much better. And I'm very happy that there was an actual psychologist sitting next to me to help untangle the story. Um, because this pattern occurred twice more when he mentioned two very good childhood friends of his. And, and so I got to talking with him, and the psychologist talked with him. And somehow we were talking about, um, what is it, road rage or aggressive driving. And he said he got really irritated at times when people would drive in a way that was, it had nothing to do with fast or slow or following the rules. It was simply inconsiderate of other drivers on the road. Uh, it could even be driving too slowly and inconsiderate uh, or cutting people off, whatever it was. Uh, and he felt that, that he was very mindful or tried to be as a driver. And um, he noticed in his life several years before that the, the way he'd react when people drove poorly was the same way he would react to his employees because he was the boss, uh, which I didn't quite understand, uh, or to his wife uh, when you know they would get in an argument or something like that. And he realized that that wasn't really a, a mature way to respond. Um, and that in fact, it might be better to put on just a sort of objective problem solving hat to, to listen, to pay attention, to consider objectively what needs to be done um, and, and not get all, uh, you know, reactive about it. And so really the story was not that, that his wife or his boss um, or his friends were something he was trying to defend against, but actually he wanted to go to the state with them that they were special people in his life, that as a boss, uh, that his wife as the most, you know, his life partner, uh, as his best friends, um, that they deserved better from him and that he wanted to take on, he said he'd been practicing this mindfulness state uh, of trying to separate from his emotional responses, uh, the sort of the limbic responses, and just be uh, present in a useful sort of, as he would describe it, a conscious way. Wow, that's uh, some amazing stories, Dario, and I certainly would assume that the, the audience listening in right now, whether it's live or replay, uh, will certainly resonate with a lot of those different scenarios and situations and it's amazing to see now that you can map that and you can see that in a brain and you can actually see how these things are influencing a state of, of uh, activity in anyone's brain and so it's uh, it, it really is great to see you know the work that you're doing to bring a lot of this awareness towards us and uh, and make us aware and be able to observe some of these things in our nature and our personality so that we can uh, you know start to, to make some choices and we've talked already uh, this uh, on the summit series about uh, how you know, our thoughts and our, our choices that we make, um, you know, our perceptions of how we see the world and a lot of even our beliefs that exist can determine a lot of things that show up in our life. And it's a, it's a really exciting time, actually. I love the work that you're doing and really um, excited about what you're finding and, and what you, you, know, that you and your colleagues are working on. It's, it's bringing a wealth of knowledge that uh, is much needed to, to the science and medicine fields. And uh, I just wanted to take a little um, breather here to let the, you guys all know that those who are here live today uh, we're taking questions as we go uh, with Dario and there's a, a little hand you can pop up, you can request to speak and either join the conversation um, or you can uh, just pop a, a message or a question in the chat box and we'll be talking with Dario uh, throughout today as, uh, as questions. So please feel free to pop those in. I noticed that we've got quite a few that are coming in already. So if you want to join in a conversation, pop your hand up. We're not going to do that for a little bit further down uh, the call, but uh, please got some questions uh, coming through. Uh, in fact, Dario, I might even jump into one or two because we have a lot of questions coming through, which is, uh, is great. And the intention here is to make sure that we're really uh, helping you know, the, the tangible application of a lot of this amazing information for people. And so I'm just going to jump in here. I've got a question from Vicky who, who says, I have a question about a brain, uh, about how a brain would develop in, in a fetus during the pregnancy of a mother under constant stress. Do you have any insights about uh, how that may influence or how that may be affected uh, in any way, shape or form? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, almost entirely, I look at um, sort of the age 15 to, to 80, essentially young adults and adults, because the, the infant brain, the fetal, fetal brain, the child brain, those, those are sort of a different category, a different creature entirely. Um, but what I do know is that the, the hormones that are released by the mother uh, in times of stress, that those do impact the fetus in a variety of ways. 
uh, and I think you probably or other people have talked about this, Matt, uh, how methylization of, of various neural pathways, uh, gene expression, and so on, that, um, that those are going to be impacted. And what the genes say, but what the genes say could be very different than the actual expression that happens later, and stress will have a big part of that. In fact, um, you know, I would certainly say that at any time we're experiencing stress, uh, particularly if we're in a body-associated state, uh, which means that we're feeling, you know, what's coming from our gut, what's coming from our limbic system and from our body, and it's a negative feeling, that those are also going to be written very strongly into the limbic system, the deep parts of the brain. And, um, and we want to be very mindful to, I would sort of say, to, to avoid those kinds of negative experiences. Right. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that perspective, Dario. And probably, yeah, as you mentioned on, on the genetic expression side of things, that even the studies in epigenetics are now showing that even a father's stress can influence an offspring's brain development. And uh, you know, we, we are starting to understand a lot more about you know, the significant impact um, you know, during, uh, during childhood uh, of how everything, you know, especially a stress state, whether it's physical stress like the environment or climate, uh, or whether it's emotional, energetic stress that's there with with uh, you know, a lot of things that impact. It's uh, starting to have a, you know, we're starting to understand a lot more now, and it's uh, it really is helping us understand where we can navigate through and how how mindful we need to be in those very young years. Mm -hmm. uh, we've just got a, another great question here. Sophia asks, uh, is there a magic number in terms of for how long and how frequently? We need to practice new habits to rewire our brains. Oh, well, yeah. So is there a magic number? Uh, for a little while, there was a magic number. Uh, <laughs> now people are a little bit more um, circumspect, or circumspect about it. I would say this. Habit building is really key, and it's absolutely the right kind of question to ask. Um, and, and I'd say, first of all, it's going to depend on the quality of the habit building that you're doing. Um, are you just trying to sort of build a single through a single modality? So what is, what's a good example? Um, let's say you're trying to change an eating behavior in your life, or you're trying to get yourself to exercise more, whatever it is. Um, how, how do we build in with that? Well, of course, you could practice. You, you could just try and do it every single day. Uh, it turns out that that's limited effectiveness. Um, and that's sort of okay, actually. The data suggests as long as you pick yourself up and try again and you keep trying, that trying is also important. But what's even more important for habit building is that we bring in all the modalities of the brain. So, for example, visualization. Uh, visualization can help tremendously. We know with athletes that if they spend time practicing in detail, visual detail, what it is that they'll be doing uh, as they do their high jump or as they're running those extra miles, uh, that actually impacts their performance positively. Uh, similarly, if we can add in uh, what Andrea Isaacs is a colleague of mine calls a mantra, uh, you know, something verbal uh, that directs our mind uh, to to help reinforce the visualization. If we also have a stance and a breathing pattern, I mean, what is it like if you want to be somebody who starts exercising? What does it feel like for somebody who is in shape? What does it feel like to be fit? And you probably, all of us have been fit before sometime in our lives. We can go back to that and we can find that and practice that. Uh, breathing is a part of that, movement is a part of that. Where we focus our attention, in other words, our gaze, that that's important too. Um, not to sound like sort of a Catholic nun about it, but if you keep looking at the chocolate cake, um, it's going to call to you. Uh, so maybe you should direct your gaze elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> You know, they say that the best way to get rid of a bad idea is to replace it with a better one. And so a lot of habit building is about approaching every modality and, and finding a sort of, I want to say like building or constructing a new self and, and practicing that each day. Now, how long to practice? Um, that, that, the sort of the jury says that it depends upon um, the difficulty of the habit that you're trying to build, which absolutely makes sense. The other I would say is how well is your brain already wired to do that habit? And the combination of those two things. So if your brain is already pretty close to well wired to doing it. So for example, I have very good willpower. Uh, exerting willpower isn't very complicated for me. Yes, of course I fail, but, uh, but still, that's something I'm well wired for. Uh, and if it's an easy task, then it might only take uh, about three weeks to do. And so they say is the low end of habit building. On the far end of habit building is going to be more complex habits 
and probably there are, are neural pathways that really need to be built and reinforced in order to make that happen. And that could be three months or more uh, of just daily concerted effort. And again, you may fall down or not do it on certain days. Uh, in fact, for example, it's, you know, you shouldn't be doing heavy exercise on the same muscle groups in every day anyway. Um, and, and so it, it's really several different factors in there. And I would say in terms of finding the replacement, uh, you know, for if you're trying to move away from something, think about what it is you want to move toward and why is sort of what motivates you. Um, and a lot of neuroscience doesn't touch at all the question of motivation. But I believe in looking at personality, which is why I look at personality, that motivation is really important because if people aren't motivated, they probably aren't going to do it. That's, uh, that's beautiful, Dario. And, and one of the questions that's coming through, which um, I'm not sure if we're at a, an answer in that from a neuroscience point of view, but maybe we can discuss this anyway. If, uh, Valerie's asking a great question here. Um, she says, I would guess that the number depends on whether the new habit comes from a place of inspiration, like a real aha moment, when it's not only your conscious mind that gets a message, but also your unconscious mind. Now, I know we're, we're often um, talking about some separate things here with measuring you know, activity in the brain and as a functional organ versus the mind, which uh, may be a concept that uh, is outside of something that's measurable at this point in time. But um, do you have any light that you could shed here for Valerie? And, and even if you've seen anything yourself, uh, you know, if we're talking about repetitive behaviors consciously that can change a habit or change a pathway versus someone who might, uh, you know, if you put your hand in a mouse trap, you're probably not gonna do it again in a big hurry versus needing to practice that you know, 5,000 times. Is there, have you got any light or can you shed any perspective on that from, uh, from what you've seen in your perspective? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, two things come to mind. Um, one, one of them I think is, is actually a really great practice that anybody who's listening now or, or if you're listening to the recording, you can do immediately um, and will be a really great start towards habit building. I myself have, have tried and I would say it's been successful on occasion doing this. Um, when we have an insight in the brain, there's actually a specific pattern that occurs. The, the, the whole neocortex, the new brain, the outer brain, is, is uh, flooded with gamma waves. So this is very high frequency activity. This is sort of like a big radio broadcast going out telling all the regions of the brain, hey, we got an insight. Uh, and some really great experiments have sort of set people up with problem solving that allows opportunity for insights and, and catching this. The challenge is that none of that insight is ever written into memory. So here's the question, how many insights have you had in your life that you've forgotten about? You won't even know because they're never written into memory. So the trick is one of the suggestions that comes out of the neuroscience research, not mine, just in general, I mean not only mine, but in general, is put into practice an insight, try it out, write it down. Uh, even in listening from today, after we talk, just spend a moment after you've listened to all of this, write down one takeaway or insight that came up for you and then think about how can you implement that in your life. Because it turns out the parts of the brain involved in writing things into long-term memory are the very same ones that are involved with things like sensation and movement. That's actually very recent information there. Uh, but really, really key to know. So if the insight, you, you got to follow it with some kind of behavior. Uh, that's my, my first suggestion. Um, the other one is a little bit more broad, but I think it's really neat to know about. Um, when people say the word unconscious, from, from a neuroscience point of view, this is, it, it, I mean, consciousness is recognized as a, as a phenomenon, even though we don't quite know what it is or where it comes from. Um, but unconscious can point to a couple of different things, and I, I think it's worthwhile to ask which one is it coming from, just to name two. Uh, sometimes there are things in the brain that we simply don't know how to verbalize, that we see it as a pattern maybe, um, it's sort of on the tip of our tongue, uh, we have a feeling, a gut feeling about somebody, whatever it is, um, we can't quite verbalize it. And a lot of times it's something that's come up in, in the right hemisphere of the brain and it hasn't crossed over into the left hemisphere where those language modules there are going to help us verbalize it. Okay, the, sometimes that's what, quote, unconscious is, is just that the long process, which might be years, of figuring out how to verbalize something. The other one is the one I think this is really neat. We don't have one brain. And I'm not talking about left and right hemispheres of the brain. What I'm talking about is that we have an old brain and a new brain. That we have, you, you have a limbic system that's really rather similar to chimpanzees and dogs and cats and so on, other mammals. And, and it's responsible for a whole bunch of things. Um, 
rage, uh, hunger, disgust, uh, sexual impulses and attraction, um, you know, strong memories, phobias, uh, all of these things that are really sort of deeply imprinted in the first few years uh, or may even be genetic uh, in our propensity and, and are really strong there. Then we have a new brain. The new brain is what you get from mimicking other people, from education, from all of your time sort of growing up. And those two brains can be in conflict. And I think no better example is this. How many times, how many people do you know who seem to date the same kind of person over and over again that isn't good for them? What about the person who is attracted to the same kind of foods to eat even though they know that the food is bad for them? What are they going to do? Well, one of it is because the limbic system is saying, hey, I love this thing or I hate this thing and you're going to do it. And then the new brain, the outer brain with its executive regions is trying to say, whoa, and put the brakes on it. Or it has a completely different idea of what it's supposed to like or what it's supposed to do. And so we have these built in, I mean, it's sort of cruel in a way that evolution has given us built in internal conflicts. And so the question is, do we try and align those? Um, do we try through a, some kind of monastic process or just sort of habit building in order to override the, the base desires of the limbic system? Uh, or, or do we try and bring them into alignment in some way by accepting things that, that are going on? Um, you know, what is it that we really like? And so I would say a lot of habit building, it's interesting because the person's trying to come at it from a conscious place, but absolutely if the unconscious is aligned to it, you know, it's very easy to make friends with someone we like. It's not easy to make friends with someone we don't like for reasons that we can't even tell why. Uh, so if you want to build friendships, and I would suggest at least listen to your limbic system about what you like, even if it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that's, that's some great tangible advice, Dario, and that might be the one nugget that everybody writes down today. <laughs> and, um, I've heard, we've got a comment from Sophia here who says, it uh, seems like Dara is wired not just for willpower, but sense of humor too. What a chock full of, of uh, info and fun interview. So uh, that's um, just sort of throw that in there amongst the, the pigeons. But uh, we've got a, a comment here from two that I just wanted to, from Karen that I just wanted to address. And it says, uh, it seems back from the stories that you were sharing before, Dara, it seems strange to characterize the first story as negative. The confirmation of the impact of this experience on current socializations is priceless. Childhood, childhood experience is priceless. I don't understand their labeling as negative. And um, I just wanted to, to jump in on that one as well, Karen, that uh, often we'll uh, have a many, many different experiences in life as we're growing up. And um, we all have very different experiences. Some people you know, may be subject to a, a, a family you know, with alcoholism and abuse, and other people may be subject to a family of care and nurturing and, and, uh, and support. Uh, there's no right or wrong in either of those circumstances. It's just how we choose to perceive things. Uh, but I guess from what Dara refers to there, as a society, we would generally class, you know, one person, one situation as more a negative situation and one as more a, a positive. So it's just an overarching perception of what's deemed as acceptable by society in those, it's, it's, in those circumstances. But it's, um, it's really important to understand that it's, it actually comes down to more of an individual perception as to how we actually you know, perceive each circumstance because uh, you can choose to have a view which, which I share uh, that everything happens for a reason and the experiences that you have uh, are there for a particular purpose and to be i guess one of the things that we really want to get as the take-home message here with dario is that to be aware of this information means that you can actually start to observe and start to take uh, some action or some transition into areas that you may want to transition uh, and so maybe the person who had the pattern that was always there replaying you know thousands and thousands of times in their brain maybe they decided that it's time for them to transition out of that and they don't need that pattern anymore that's been there for so long so it was just a, more of a, an overarching comment there, but it comes down to everybody's individual perception. And that really is important to understand. I just wanted to get that concept across on this call today, that uh, the way that everybody chooses to perceive an event can be very different. Uh, I often use an example, I could drop an iPhone, the new iPhone off the table and it smashes. Uh, one person can see that as a negative experience, another person can see that as a positive experience. In fact, the person who doesn't like Apple would be pretty happy about that circumstance. The person who just bought the phone may be yeah, less happy about that circumstance. So. It comes down to a lot of different uh, things, perception and beliefs and other things that may underpin that. But um, I just want to, to sort of clear up that, uh, that there's there's nothing that um, that can be negative for everybody or positive for everybody. It comes down to everybody's individual perceptions. And Dara, I just want to use that as a segue to lead into uh, maybe a bit of a discussion about how you see differences in people's brains. You mentioned at the start of this call that 
you know, there's not one single person that you've mapped on a brain that's been the same. And, and we talk uh, very much from a personalised health perspective that every single person on the planet is different. There's not one single one of us that's the same with our genes. And if there is identical twins, which is a very, very minor part, because of their environment and their lifestyles, they're actually different people because they have different genes expressed at different points in time. So would you be able to share with us, again, just bringing this back to more of a personalised health and for the listeners here today, uh, what have you seen in, in terms of people's brains and, and what hope do we have in terms of individuals moving forward to be able to change maybe some of our brain patterns that exist? You know, if we're, if we maybe we find ourselves doing the same old thing or maybe we feel like we're in a rut, maybe we feel like you know, we're in a circumstance that's very difficult to change or we feel like we've had childhood experiences that have been stuck with us and we're trying to break these patterns. Um, is there hope for us and what sort of things can we start to be thinking about to maybe do to, to sort of uh, transition if we're ready for that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's um, um, first off, I, I want to say that uh, the questions about how we use this information that is really among the, the top questions that I get. Uh, you know, sort of like, oh, this is great to know about the brain, but is it really practical? Can we do something with it? And usually, it revolves around the kinds of questions that we've gotten, uh, understanding how we arrive to today, uh, getting a sense of what it is that we can specifically through habit building or, or coaching or counseling or whatever to move forward towards a desired outcome, uh, whatever those might be. So naturally, I'm happy to say that, that I've had colleagues who've really sort of pushed and prodded me to look at uh, how do we address applications. And uh, this is, goes up in two ways, um, uh, certainly at least two ways. Uh, one of them is that uh, I look at... Um, what goes on in people's brains as they engage in a coaching or therapy session. Uh, now, the coaching or therapy isn't necessarily something that's overtly psychological. It is was with Andrea Isaacs, a lot of it was um, for people wanting just to establish new habits in their lives. And uh, there was a couple of questions she had in coming to me, sort of very happily bringing half a dozen clients just to sort of see what happens and reporting that afterwards. Um, the first thing she wanted to know is, is does my technique work? Okay, do, do we actually see any changes in the brain at all during a therapy build or, or habit building session? And the other one was, uh, if I teach a person some technique that they can use and that they come back the next day or a few days later and they repeat that by themselves, um, can they actually activate that in the brain? And I'm happy to say the answer is yes. I mean, at least for her and a couple of other people, the techniques that, that I've looked at. Um, so, for example, one gentleman came in, and um, his, his request was, he said, you know, I'm not good at identifying goals in my life, and I'm particularly not good at following through on goals. And he said, what can I do about this? And so she spent an hour, as she does, with each of her clients, uh, with him, and the first 20 minutes or so are just a warm-up exercise, is getting him to stand up, to move, to breathe uh, in different ways, uh, to sort of shed the prior day and, and sort of preconceptions. The next 20 minutes are about picking a particular space that he would like to be in and building some habits around that, sort of broadly a space, whether it's a space of confidence, a space of creativity, uh, a space of nurturing, you know, sort of like she has like nine or so spaces that people can they select one and they sort of build. The, we say the environment and the infrastructure for the specific change to take place. And then in the last third, she introduces, uh, or she, she works with them to create um, a new behavior that has visual, auditory, sensation, uh, movement, breathing, uh, where they place their awareness, all of these factors sort of, you know, integrated towards one particular outcome as a habit that they can try from one day to the next and, and sort of internalize that. Now, we found this gentleman to be a particular challenge because one thing she feels is really important is people need to be in their body uh, when they are learning a new habit. So I can tell that very easily on the EEG, this has been known for years, when people are in an alpha state, and alpha just dominates over a lot of the brain, uh, that means a person's uh, connection to the limbic system, to their gut, all that information is flowing sort of very nicely. And, um, and he was a big challenge because he just refused to stay in alpha. You know, she, she'd give him sort of exercises to feel his hands and his fingers and his toes and feel his gut and his breathing. And it would last about two or three seconds, and then it would just go away, unlike most people. Um, 
And this presented a real problem. I mean, this was a challenge. I don't want to say problem, but it was a challenge. Um, because how is he going to recruit his body when he wants to be disassociated so quickly from it? Um, to compound to this, this was sort of an interesting story. He was very surprised because he said, well, you know, I've been doing, I've been practicing and teaching meditation for 20 years. Meditation, our technique, is all about getting in touch with the body. And I kept sort of having to signal to, to Andrea that, like, no, it's not happening. Um, and when he described the meditation technique, which I won't get into, but I will say that what we saw at the end with the brain wiring is that he had four brain regions which were very heavily wired with each other that all reflected perfectly his meditation technique. And the problem is, is that meditation technique did not include action taken out in the world around forming goals and following through with goals. So what were we to do? Well, just being able to signal Andrea and let her know he's not in this alpha state, his body connected, reminded her to go back and do it again with him and do it again. And finally, by the end of the session, just through constant repetition, I was able to give her this feedback, sort of like biofeedback, uh, that he was able to get more into this body connected state. And then to build the, the new habit that would be around goal making, following through with goals, I said, you know, that may need to wait a little bit. And in fact, it did until the next day. Um, when we looked at his brain wiring, and I really had to say, you know, all the, the all the wiring that would lead to that executive region of the brain with goals, all of it was weak, but it wasn't all equally weak. And there were one or two circuits there that I thought we could tap, but I'm like, if you do something with his personal identity and values, and the, the, his goals and actions will follow from those, but that probably is a better approach than some of the other approaches that one might take to goal setting. And because that was a region, the sort of this personal identity and belief is very much tied in, tied in with his meditation technique and already very well wired. So this is a rather long and specific example, but it was something that was, I want to say, was really, really informed by the neuroscience. And we actually needed to have the machine there and, and to get the computer results in order to locate uh, or to have confidence in locating the technique that would work for him. Um, and that, yeah. I think, represents some of the challenge that can come with it, but also the huge promise of neuroscience. Well, it's, uh, it's fascinating, Darren, and it really does highlight the fact that, uh, you know, you mentioned about the patterns, but even the patterns that we believe that are positive um, or negative or whatever our perception might be, it's just really important to understand that patterns are patterns. Whatever we practice, it, it's there. And uh, you know, no matter what we believe at a particular point in time, just be aware of whatever we're practicing will be ingrained. It's uh, it is repetition that does make things. So, you know, we're, we're all used to getting out of bed in the mornings and brushing our teeth. That's all. If we brush our teeth before we go to bed, hopefully most people do both these days. Um, yeah. you know, having a shower, uh, hopefully again daily for most people. This is something that we we're, we're used to doing. It's a habit that we have. We get up and we do it. Um, yeah, we probably spend quite a number of years, you know, growing up years, you know, complaining about it and doing what we need to do, but then we form the habit and we just do it regularly. This is really what we're, we're starting to realize now in terms of harnessing our health and actually taking you know, ownership and control of our health is that we need to start to be very aware of the choices that we make because what we choose to do now will eventually become a habit if we're doing this. So you know, if we, you know, often it's, uh, you know, we hear the sayings that you know, the hardest thing about going for a run is putting your shoes on. You know, once your shoes are on, you can actually go out for a run. It's, you've got over that. If the issues are on, you may as well do it. And if you get into that habit regularly, then you actually start to enjoy exercise, whereas before you might not have. Uh, many, many different things, looking at the foods you eat, looking at the people you hang out with, or the circumstances you're in, the way that your mind works, all these things uh, are really important to, to start to be aware of observing what you're currently doing, because maybe the patterns that are there for you, maybe something you're ready to transition or change. Uh, maybe you're here listening to this uh, summit because you're ready for something different in your life. Uh, maybe you're here just for confirmation that what you're doing is fantastic. Uh, either way, uh, it's really important just to be aware of the, the science that we're now finding through Dara and, and the amazing work that he's doing with many other colleagues to help us understand that what we do actually sticks. And, uh, and we now have a choice. Uh, we always have a choice as to what we do. Uh, we get to choose from a health perspective. We get to choose the food that goes in our mouth. We get to choose the exercise that we do or don't do. We get to choose the client we live in. We get to choose the people we hang out with. We get to choose our friends. We get to choose uh, you know, our natural you know, talents and what we do with our time. We get to choose all these sorts of things uh, and it's really important to understand that we can now harness this uh, and start to be in control of our circumstances around and transition things that may be there and, and may have been there for quite a long time. So, uh, Daria, thank you so much for sharing those examples. It's uh, it's fascinating to hear you know the actual science and 
and physical objective data behind some of these concepts that we've heard about for so, so long. And uh, I just want to jump into a, a couple of, or just one question actually clarifying, you were talking a bit about alpha state and about uh, theta state. And uh, I just wanted to, to sort of have, if you can explain just briefly that what, what sort of brain frequencies are, because a lot of people hear about these getting into an alpha state or a theta state, or you talked about gamma as well. You know, just very briefly, what are the states and what sort of things, you know, may, what, what sort of functions do they, uh, do they have for us in certain states or what, what things may be beneficial in certain parts? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I want to say first, just very briefly, uh, tapping into what you said about the example of an exercise, you know, the, the hardest step is putting your shoes on. Uh, I really was able to get back and to exercise myself a few years ago by quitting the gym. Um, because this went to the personality part of it, that yes, I have good willpower, but I also have a high value on efficient use of time. And I discovered that going to the gym was a very inefficient use of my time because I spent more time driving, preparing, parking, all of that than I did actually in the gym. Um, and just quitting the gym and finding an open space that I can step outside my door with a preparation time of two minutes instead of 20 minutes or 30 minutes uh, completely changed my daily habits. Uh, mm -hmm. By simply recognizing, you know, what is it? It's not that... I can't get myself up in the morning. It's not that I'm lazy, whatever it is, that you know, the negative messages we may have for ourselves. Simply recognizing what are our values and then doing something to make sure our values get met uh, along with our goals. That's now, really important, Dari. Thank you for bringing that to, to our attention. That's a, a very good observation that uh, probably many can apply to their lives. So thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, now as for these brain frequencies, yeah, you may have heard these terms like brain waves. Uh, they go by like delta waves, alpha waves, and so on. I, I don't want to really get into all of them because that could be a whole chapter in a book. Um, but I would say that you know, sort of a nice way to think of it is that they're like radio stations. Um, and as you're doing any kind of activity, you can tune to a different radio station. You can do easy listening music uh, that's sort of like a delta waves that's calm. That's like when you're asleep or sort of mindlessly watching a TV show. Um, it, you could be something that's a little bit more active, sort of soft rock, uh, that's sort of the theta waves, the problem solving, when we already know how to solve the problem. So it's just sort of like busy work in a way and tends to be a little bit disassociated. Uh, the one that I th think has gotten a lot of press over the years is alpha waves. And that's the kind of music that whatever it is we're listening to, that it moves us. Um, it's not frenetic, it's, it's not uh, stressful, but it moves us. It's very body connected. Um, and it shows uh, one variety of times, and in fact, anybody doing this, you don't need a brain machine or whatever to know what are the kinds of things that tend to induce alpha, uh, that tend to, to link the body, uh, the gut, uh, the limbic system, the higher brain, all of that together. When we have our eyes closed, and we focus on something that we enjoy or is positive, like listening to favorite music, uh, doing a meditation, uh, recalling a past positive experience, uh, doing a visualization exercise around some kind of positive outcome. We can also get into neg uh, alpha around negative things. For example, if I ask you to spend three minutes reviewing a negative childhood experience that was traumatizing, you're not gonna be too happy when you come out of that experience. Uh, because you probably will have connected with your body if I ask you, you know, what, what, did, what does it feel like, focus on that, what were you noticing, all of those things. So that's why I keep mentioning this word positive here, um, so that there are things that we can right away connect to and why we enjoy listening to our favorite music, why we enjoy uh, recalling past experiences or just reveling in something that we might do that's exciting. Uh, and th so those are things we can do right away to get into alpha. There's also beta waves, and, and I think beta waves are reflect where we spend a lot of our everyday life, uh, particularly at work. And they run sort of along the spectrum from just active problem solving uh, to, to problem solving where there's a reward. It could be internal drive, it could be external promise of reward, and that's exciting. We feel competitive about it. We want to do well. It's a motivation space. Uh, but beyond that can also come things with fear of failure. And so beta can also come with, uh, you know, some anxiety and, and some difficulties if what we're tackling is too hard and the stakes are too high. And, and we know that this is, uh, beta is important because it, really, it correlates with dopamine release in the brain. Um, so if you've read about dopamine, you know what some of 
its effects are is, is reward based, not a surprise. And so knowing about beta, to find that sweet spot, you know, they talk about that sweet spot between the, the, the difficulty of the challenge and our ability to do it. You sort of want to be in the middle of beta where you know you can do it and you're going to get a reward for it. You're not quite sure how you're going to do it, but you have that confidence there. Um, gamma is, is the highest frequency. And this is associated with excitement, with aha insights during problem solving. And also, as I've learned by showing people pretty pictures of other people, uh, sexual arousal and interest. And, um, and by the way, when people view pictures of others that they find attractive, the brain responds so fast, you know, like 200 microseconds, is not even time for, uh, for you to really have a, a genuine judgment about it. The brain already reveals. It's sort of voyeuristic, I have to say, in the brain machine. Because you can tell when the person looks at stuff who it is that they're attracted to. Um, so that's sort of an overview there of, the, of those different brain waves. And I would say certainly um, we might want it to be aware of what kind of state we're in when we're doing particular tasks. So like math, for example, some people get math anxiety. Uh, other people feel, find math fairly easy, so it, it's sort of comfortable to do. Uh, so just being aware of what kind of space we tend to be in when we do tasks, I think, can be very useful um, because at least it tells us where our starting point is. And then if we want to move somewhere else where there are coaching and counseling techniques to help make that happen. Beautiful, Dario. Thanks for the, the great summary there. And I think uh, that, that certainly highlights a lot of the interesting questions that people have got coming up. And, and really uh, helps us understand a bit more about all these different frequencies that exist about sometimes why we may transition between them all and uh, how we may observe ourselves in those different states as we go throughout the day or, or throughout certain tasks and activities and events that we have. Um, one of the questions that really you know, bring a lot of this together uh, as we come you know, more towards the end of the session is understanding you know, how we can own our personality. So as, you, as we've talked about, everybody's different. Everybody has a different personality, has different brain regions going off in different uh, connections. How can we start to own our personality to have more fun? Um, how, do, how can you have more happiness in our life? Do you have any insights there that you can share with us? Um, yeah, that's a good question, uh, particularly because I, I'm not the kind of person that thinks about, is it fun? Uh, as, as you know, when, when I do something, there are some people who do ask that question. Um, and uh, I suppose it's not that fun is the opposite of willpower, but, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, that's a, what, what leads to greater satisfaction in life, of course. Um, I think that's where a lot of the personality information comes in because the neuroscience with the brain wiring and looking at how the brain frequencies are during particular tasks, that, that's very uh, reductive. It's very much looking at the parts. It's not looking at the whole. Um, when we look at the whole, we, we can see, we can look at a couple of things. One of them is just how does the brain react as a whole? For example, what gets us into a state of flow? I think we'll talk about that a little bit right after this um, because that's a whole topic, a whole really neat topic. What brings us to a state of flow? Um, the other is, is being aware of um, that stuff that's a little bit beyond just the brain. You know, I mentioned what are the contributions to people's brain wiring? Well, certainly you can see evidence in adults of their career, uh, some of their childhood, uh, perhaps their parents. I have some great examples of a parent and a teenager coming in, and they're actually their brains are quite similar, maybe for one child and one parent, and quite different for another child. Um, and needless to say, everybody is aware of which child is like which parent uh, when those happen. Um, so there's that side of it, but there's also the side of these really great correlations statistically between people's brain wiring and the personality profiles that they identify with. So uh, I've done a, I've used primarily uh, the Myers Briggs type indicator uh, types and assessments, um, those profiles. Uh, I've also done some work with Enneagram because again, it's a very holistic approach um, to to what's going on with folks. And I would say it's really remarkable. I mean, you look at people who share the same uh, personality preferences uh, that they could share anywhere from 80% of their brain wiring, uh, maybe even higher than that in some cases. You know, I would say if we think of it as a pie, maybe 5% of the folks in that pie have very, very similar brain activity, like 95%. Uh, the biggest piece of the pie, though, was like the 80% range, which is really quite remarkable statistically. Um, 
And then there are, of course, some folks who were a little bit different, you know, the, for whatever reason, they decided to use uh, different tools in order to meet the same needs uh, that they have with other folks of the same type. Why don't I mention this is because, well, the great thing is, is there aren't a lot of brain imaging options out there that are going to tell you what I'm talking about. But there are lots of wonderful materials out there that can help you discover what are your personality preferences. And um, I just think knowing those, it's not like the goal is to settle on a, a best fit type and then that's it. The point is, like with anything, that there's a journey to it. And that opportunity to get a language, to be able to talk about what are your values, what are your needs, um, and to meeting those. Uh, and and uh, the same, the personality preferences, like I know even though I travel quite a bit and I can get on stage and talk to 800 people and seem very extroverted, my students think I'm an extrovert, I can tell you I'm not an extrovert, okay? I recharge by myself. I'm, very, I'm creative best by myself. I work best by myself. Um, even though I can stretch, I have a preference. Now, this is great that you're wondering maybe what's the science behind this. The science is one that statistically significant correlations. People with similar brain wiring have similar personality preferences. Great. That means if you know your personality well, you can sort of work backwards and you have an idea. The other thing is looking at people as they did different stuff. What are times when their brain got into sync? When all the regions are acting together, when they're in the state of flow, well, the beautiful thing is people with similar personality types, actually it's the same kind of activities that get them into flow. I mean, for some people it's about active listening, believe it or not. I mean, that's what gets them into a state of flow is actively listening to others. Uh, for other people, uh, there's a completely different pattern. Okay, as Matt shared earlier, uh, as many people do, um, his brain actually can really, all the regions get in sync around efficiency. There's no reason to expend a lot of resources for most of our daily tasks, so why not just be efficient about them? Um, there are these different patterns. For me, it's about thinking about the future. Okay, the visualizing what the future will be like. All of my brain just recruits all of the different regions of the brain to come in and, and to help answer that question. There's a wide, wide variety of things, and just by knowing our personality preferences, it turns out we know what can take the brain into a state of flow. And therefore, I think when people are in flow, they're really happy with what they're doing. They really enjoy those times when they lose track of time and are being creative and, and productive, where they're stretching themselves. Uh, they don't feel, there's a challenge, but they don't feel anything uh, over-challenged or whatnot. It's, um, it's, the flow is a beautiful space to be in. That's beautiful, Dario, and thanks for sharing that. And it does really bring uh, a lot of the, the hard science to you know, the concepts that we talk about a lot in terms of, you know, even the people you hang out with um, can determine a lot of the state of health and happiness that you have. And, and you're looking at the science now that shows that, that, you know, people with different uh, or very similar personalities to be, that are very close to in sync, for those people to be around each other can actually, uh, you know, equal a place in a space uh, of, of connectedness and of happiness in a very easy, uh, you know, place of flow and, and allowing magic to happen. So uh, thank you for sharing that perspective. And uh, Dario, we've, um, we tend to get carried away when we're chatting about the brain and neuroscience and personality and fun and happiness. And uh, unfortunately, that's probably going to be enough time for us today. We could probably talk for another 16 years about this stuff, and I'm sure we probably will, but maybe not in this call. So I uh, just want to say thank you so much for, for making the time to be here for us, for sharing your wealth of wisdom uh, with all the people on the call today. Uh, it's been a very tangible call. Uh, let's please take Dario's advice and write down one nugget that you've learned from today's call. Uh, that you can apply to your life and, and have that that sits in the, the memory bank, hopefully, that you can use uh, to help transition your way to health and happiness. And some of the concepts that we've discussed today are really important just to be aware of, is, if nothing else, to observe uh, a lot of the things that are happening in your life at this point in time and be aware that you can actually change long-lasting habits that exist in your brain. That's one of the most powerful uh, learnings, I believe, that, uh, that we can get from this call, is that even though we may have had childhood experiences and patterns that have been playing for you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of times over many, many years and decades, it's actually changeable. We actually have the power to control what happens with our future. We have the power to control and change what our brain actually you know, results in, our, what our brain shows and what determines our actions and our behaviours. So, Dario, thank you so much for being here and thank you all for you dialing in and taking the time to uh, invest this into your health and into your happiness. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on many, many more sessions. And uh, thank you again. If you want to find out more information, please go to our Facebook page. 
uh, and that has all the information, all the latest action and bonuses and downloads and schedules and everything that's there. Uh, and our YouTube channel, please subscribe and you get access to all of the video interviews that we're doing for free. So um, if you want to find out more about Dario too, uh, Dario actually does this for a living. He, uh, he you know, measures your brain. He, you can look at your personality type uh, and a fascinating report on, on everything to do with you. Uh, please go and visit DarioNardi.com to check out more information about Dario and what he does. It's absolutely fascinating. And Dario, thank you so much for the work that you're doing to help us understand better about our brains and how we can actually start to control some of the, the processes that are coming for us in the future. So uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dario, and look forward to talking to you again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having you and wishing you all the best week ahead. Thanks, Dario. Thank you all. Bye. Cheers.